You got the Lord R2 right here, and we're drinking at Moe's. We're about to have a good time. We hope you do, too. Woo! All right, everybody, taking time out before we get this show started that uh, I want to thank Reaper Apparel for having Dragonimos be a brand ambassador for their clothing line. They got good stuff. They got T-shirts. They got hoodies. They got beans. They got lots of great stuff, encouraging everybody to break out of their comfort zone, live their best self, and Hey, it's something I try to live every day. Now, be sure when you go and you're finishing filling out your order, use the code Drinking at Mo's, get 10% off, and the link and the code will both be in the description. Let's fucking All right, go. everybody. Welcome to Drink the Mo's. Big Mo here. You know the drill by now. YouTube, like, subscribe, share, comment, all the good stuff. Because the YouTube algorithm is a pain in the ass. We're in most places you can find your audio podcast, too. Leave a review there because I'm needing more reviews on the audio damn things. But today, I'm excited to have with me Lord I2. How are you doing? Not too bad, man. I'm excited to be here. How about yourself? Oh, I, I can't complain. I added some more stuff to my little collection back here. So I that I'm big into wrestling figure collecting. So like I, I got a new Target exclusive one that I was pretty excited about. I'm nice. um, gonna right. be getting the chance to Go to Sammy Callahan's promotion, Wrestling Revolver, here December 2nd. Nice. And unless something happens and he's not able to make it, I'm going to be able to get to meet uh, Ortiz. All right. That sounds pretty cool. Oh, yeah. And then, oh, they've got Matt. The one match in particular I'm excited about, I mean, excited about the whole show but the second gear crew versus alex cologne steve macklin and ricky shane page that sounds like a great match oh yeah Yeah. i've uh i've actually had alex cologne on the show before so to get to actually finally meet him in person is gonna be cool I guess, and I don't really have to worry about an autograph because I already got his uh, ringborn <laughs> nice. pad signed by him. So I'm, I'm doing good. I'm excited, and I'm excited to have you on here. Now, first thing I like to start off everybody with is what got you started as a fan, and then what made you finally decide to make that leap into the business. Well, that's a uh, that's a pretty. Long, like, I was born into it, man. My, uh, like, as long as I can remember, wrestling's been a thing. My dad used to watch it. His cousins and uncle used to take them to L.A. at the Forum to watch Lucha Libre, to watch WWF when they came down. Um, so we just, you know, always were raised with it. And the moment that made me want to be a wrestler was uh, – so those two moments, actually. One, when I was a kid um, – I forgot what pay-per-view it was because I was really young, but all I remember was Bret Hart, my favorite wrestler. He'd come out, put the glasses on the kid, and, like, for me, that was super big. Like, I always wish I could be that kid. I could be, I wish I was that, but I knew my family situation where we were never going to be front row. That was probably never going to happen. And then I kind of thought, well, wouldn't it be cooler to be the guy giving the glasses to the kid? being on the other side, making those moments. And so that was something that was, you know, ever since I was a kid, wanted to be a wrestler, wanted to be a wrestler. Um, Probably like many people uh, growing up, I didn't know there was wrestling other than WWE and WCW, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, like, sure, you see the AAA and then every once in a while reference to New Japan, but it's like that, Mm -hmm. I thought that was like Mexico's WWE and Japan's WWE. 
Yeah. Um, it wasn't until I want to say 2010, I was at a Madden tournament, ironically, uh, in at a GameStop in Cerritos, California, and a ring announcer for uh, Championship Wrestling from Hollywood. He worked there, and he had flyers uh, for their first taping. And on that flyer, uh, there was a couple things that I that caught my eye. First was the NWA Championship because they were uh, mm. affiliated with NWA at the time, and that was like literally right up right when um what was it TNA mm. uh, stopped yeah. using the NWA and they started using their own belt. So that belt was you know on the on the indie scene, and uh, I went to the championship rest from Hollywood. I seen it. Well, uh, go back to the flyer. So I saw that title and then I saw, uh, Percy Pringle, Paul bear. Mm. He was on that flyer and he was a manager for, uh, now LA Knight, but at the time, Sean Ricker. Mm. And, uh, so those two things were, I was like, Oh, okay. You know, wrestling right in my, my backyard. I'm, I'm in. So I took my wife at the time and we watched the very first taping and it was incredible. Like, uh, a lot of guys that were there are now, you know, up in the big leagues. Yeah. You know, Cesaro, uh, what was it Peter Avalon? I know he uh, he's <laughs> AEW every once in a while, but he was he was the one guy that made me like, uh, dude, I want to do this because when he when they billed him before he came out, before I even knew who he was, they were like the biggest man in professional wrestling. So I'm thinking like a Braun Strowman, a <laughs> monster yeah. of a man, and then here comes out little Peter Avalon, dude, just scrawny. But the, the like oh dude he was in it he he believed he was the biggest man in professional wrestling mm. so I believed it and like I fell in love throughout that uh, throughout that first taping like they shot out the email I whipped out my phone and I emailed like right there and then how do I get how do I become a part of this and he sent me to um, a school in Anaheim called Mach One Wrestling mm. where uh, the the great late Johnny and uh, ran the promotion there. And it was the most amazing time in my life, man. Like training was amazing. They had training Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Mondays and Wednesdays were for beginners. Uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays were for advanced. And then every Friday they had a wrestling show there. So it was like five days of just pure wrestling and I threw myself in it, dude. I was there Monday through Friday. I uh, Before I had my first match, I trained for about six months. And I know for the most part, people train for about a year, nine yeah. months, you know. I I think I got that extra kick to, to do it because I was there every practice. Even when I first started, I was at the advance. I did what I could. I sat and I watched. I shut up, watched, soaked it all in, man. And it's been... It's been one hell of a ride. <laughs> oh, I I can imagine, and you know, I I can see how you know being there every practice, even when you don't necessarily have to be, that putting in a good impression there, and you know, kind of getting you that that spot on a card when you know, like you said, a lot of people do tend to train a little more towards like nine months to a year, maybe even longer before they yeah. get that first match. Yeah. I got lucky because uh, like a lot of guys, they have, uh, you know, the real world, they have their shoot jobs, they have kids, families. I was 20 years old and then I didn't have any kids. Uh, the job I was working, it was, you know, daytime. So, uh, training was always at night. The the shows were at night, so I was free. You know, before then okay. I wasn't really doing much, so yeah, I jumped and, wholeheartedly into it. Oh, I can imagine. And you know, when you were bringing up some of the stuff there before we jump into some of the other things I have here, the time frame in California. I'm trying to remember who who was it that was the NWA champ at the time because. When you were talking about that, that sounded a lot like the time I was stationed in San Diego with the Navy back like 08 through 12. Okay. So the, it sounded familiar. And, you know, you bring up Peter Avalon. He was one of the guys, I think, good Lord, when I first, and those were the shows that like got me started on 
independent wrestling and Peter Avalon one to say was just getting started around that time, at least getting onto the show. So when I was seeing, you know, championship wrestling from Hollywood, you know, now the stuff that he's doing with AEW, I'm like, holy crap, I remember that guy. Yeah, it, it's amazing to see it from, like, being there with them and watching, watching the growth and seeing, like, where he was then and, like, how he is now. And, it, like, that, that confidence never wavered. Like, it, it just grew. Like, you know, back in 2010, 11, he believed he was the biggest man in professional wrestling. <laughs> I have to believe now he thinks he's, like, a, a god, you know what I mean? Like, because that, that confidence, what he's got to be able to do, and, like, just, like, the overall uh, pre- presentation of him and his evolution has been amazing to see. No, that that it has been. And, you know, I was just going back to the whole NWA champ at the time. I'm wanting to say it, the NWA champ at the time, if, because I know I, I got to actually see that title there defended on a few shows. I believe it was Adam Pierce, actually. Yep, yep. Scrap Daddy Adam Pierce. It was it like flopped, I think, between him and then Colt Cabana because they oh. had a pretty long rivalry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it would flop between the, those guys and stuff like that. They had a pretty good. Uh, it was pretty. Well, Championship Wrestling from Hollywood had a pretty solid uh, roster throughout the years. Like, they, they had Aust- Austin Aries with them for a while with uh, Joey Chaos, which I know mm. a lot of people don't necessarily probably know when they first comes ahead, but if you're from California, then you know oh, oh, who Joey oh, yeah. Chaos and Santino Brothers are. No, but, no, you know, no. it, was, it was really cool, too. Uh, sorry to jump back, but when I first started wrestling, like, it was cool. To cre- it was kind of crazy to me to be training with these guys because a lot of the guys in SoCal were on a show from MTV, Wrestling Society X. Mm, yeah. And, and, it, and it blew my mind. That, like, I was like, dude, I was watching you guys when I was in high school. Like, I remember, too, it was like the crazy, like – I know people look back on that time of uh, wrestling when you watch it, like not the greatest, but as a fan, especially as a, a, as a teenager, you had WCW or not WCW, ECW on Tuesdays. Mm-hmm. Then you had wrestling society X and then, uh, you know, Raw, SmackDown, TNA, like it was wrestling almost every day. It was like, a it's getting back to that now, but yeah, yeah. wrestling society X, I've been lucky enough to, talk with a handful of people that were actually there on those shows like uh believe he went by gq money at the time but ryan katz had had yeah, him he, on a, a while back i've oh god i i'm getting close to my 200th episode so some information is yeah. escaping me at the time but i know it's been a few people but yeah, that was a wild show. Yeah, uh, I I actually I'm dying. I I would do whatever to get like a like that rebooted, like to get another little season, like because it was it was re- like it was off wrestling, like it was it was not what you were used to, like yeah. not necessarily like death match and extreme, but it was it was like a the entertaining version of death matches. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So it was like, it, it was always a, a spectacle to watch. Like, that's what I imagined when wrestling first took off, like back in the 1900s, 1800s or whatever, when it was like a, a carnival event or a circus event. Like, yeah. That's the way these people saw it. And you know what I mean? Like, that was like the modern version of circus wrestling. You know? Oh, yep. Yep. Oh, man. That is bringing back some memories. Like, I remember watching that. And just being glued, and then all of a sudden it just stopped. Yeah, and like I, Ryan Katz, we actually talked about what was going on during that time because I was like telling him I remember being glued, and then like I said, it just all of a sudden just out of nowhere stopped. Yeah, that that one was a gem right there. That was a diamond in the rough. Like if we can get something. Get something back, man. Like that. That would oh, be yeah. that would be a game changer. Like, oh yeah, that and, like. Oh, go oh ahead. no, I was gonna say because like uh, 
uh, GQ Money. It was funny because at Chapter the Rest of Hollywood, when I when I got to make my debut and get in, uh, he was one of my first. Sorry, I got three kids. Uh, one of them. Yeah, it's all good. It's all <laughs> yeah. Um, he was like a our de facto leader for a bit because Joey Chaos was our original leader. We were uh, we were a group called uh, Disorder, and like mm. we made our debut. Out, buddy. We made our uh, we made our debut um, attacking. I want to say Willie Matt and a few other like guys during their matches, and we just had like uh, blue jeans, black tank tops, and um, it was it was a fun experience. Oh, hold on, what's it? Hey, Peter, come on, dude. Do you mind if I change scenes real quick? It'll be a quick little transition. I got another oh, little yeah. room I can hide out to. I, I can, I can pause it real quick. Yeah, that would be. All right, we're back. But uh, you're bringing up Joey Chaos there. He was actually in only my second ever independent wrestling show. Oh, really? So okay. He, he was in there. And I got to see him a couple other times. And I have actually talked with him about coming on the show. But. He's a busy man. Yeah. So, nailing down everything with, you know, dates and, it, you know, him doing everything he's doing with Santino's and the shows that Santino's runs and everything. Yeah. It'll happen eventually. Oh, excuse yeah. me. I, I love my Dr. Pepper, but it gives me the burps like crazy. <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a hustler, man. He's a... He was someone that I, I wish, like, I wish I knew about Santino Brothers back when they first opened. Now, granted, I was, like, 12 years old, so I doubt they would have took me in. But I, at that time, you know, me and my friends were, like, doing worse to our bodies. So wrestling probably would have been better for us, you know? Like, <laughs> that that would have been that would have been a fun experience. Oh, but, I, uh, can, I can imagine. Yeah. Like, I, and I know uh, he's on the... He's on kind of like the naughty list, and no one no one likes to talk about him. But one of my trainers, uh, Joey Ryan, like I know, personal stuff aside, everything he taught me in that ring will always make me grateful for that guy because he showed that like uh, character character work kind of beats like all the spotty stuff and everything. Like now, not always because obviously you got a lot of fans who love seeing that stuff. I like seeing that stuff. But when it comes to it being a necessity, I've seen, like, if you just watch Japanese wrestling, man, there was a guy that wrestled a blow-up doll. There was no, oh, yeah. Nine, you know what I mean? I think, was it Kenny Omega wrestled a nine-year-old, a little girl? You yep. know what I mean? Like, it. Uh, hell, one of my buddies, uh, Rudy Rogers, we were wrestling out in a AOW um, out in 29 Palms. And uh, one of his opponents was running late. And he, they were, someone made a joke and was like, oh, just send Rudy out there and wrestle the Invisible Man. And he was like, when he hears a dumb idea, he goes, all right, I'll do it. I'll do it. And then the promoter was like, fuck it, dude. You go ahead and try it. And he went out there and he wrestled the Invisible Man. It, it was good, man. Like, <laughs> he, he got the fans popping, you know. Oh. You guys, uh, Sexy Chino out there. Mm. I know he's done that a few times. And anything that man does is gold. Like he just, he's just <laughs> yeah. entertaining. You know what I mean? Like, Oh yeah. Yeah. It's always oh, nice man. like, I've seen stuff like that pulled off with, I'm um, forgetting where I'm for some reason, I'm wanting to say GCW, but it might've been somewhere else where they did like the invisible man versus invisible Stan or something. And it was just, the ref like reacting, and they had like <laughs> the, the table just, it, it just, yeah, it was something else. That that's that's what I love about wrestling. Like that's where I differ from a lot of people. Is like I legit see it as an art form. Like I take it serious, but not like in the in the aspect like oh you have to it has to be this formula. You have to do it this way, and if you don't do it this way, it's not wrestling. It's, yeah. You know what I mean? As long as it's entertaining, because that's the point of, that's the, the reason why we do it, is to entertain. That's how we make the money. You entertain. Because if you're not entertaining anybody, no one's showing up, no one's getting paid. Yeah. True. Unless whoever's booking the show has deep pockets, and then, 
yeah, sometimes you just get paid regardless. Yeah. Now, I had this kind of different order in my notes, but I figured we're talking about Cali. I'll go into this. He actually recently had a match out there. I believe it was like November 4th. So it was like, as of recording this a couple weeks ago, yeah. what, like, it was like 3PWA, which I've been hearing more about them because I've been having a lot of Southern California talent on. What do you got going on there? Uh, so that one's uh, kind of a, it's a personal connection. Uh, the One of the guys in charge of everything is uh, my father-in-law. And uh, they're having a fundraiser show because the ring and sound equipment got stolen. And they were trying to do a show to to kind of get, you know, some of that funding to get the ring back and everything that the insurance is going to pay for. Um, so my wife volunteered me. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I volunteered myself as well because, you know, I, I miss the burgers out there being out in Missouri. Uh, mm. It's just not the same. Like the food's not the same. Uh, and it's, it's weird because I know a lot of people think the food out here is better because they, you know, you like steak, pork, stuff like that. I'm a basic man. I like cheeseburgers and California yeah. has the best ones, man. Like I, there's just something about them. They, they make them different. I don't know. The, no, the temperature, I, the sea levels, it's something. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I can, I can verify California does have a lot of good burger joints out there. So and I love a good cheeseburger as much as anybody. Probably one of my favorite foods actually. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. But no, it was, it, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, just uh, the, to finish up on that show, it was, it was great to be back there because I was uh, I was there for his first shows, you know, when he was running it out in California consistently. Um, then we moved out, uh, out here to Missouri um, and kind of just trying to redo myself out here, like, you know, rebuild out California. I got, I got, I hit a stagnant spot, you know, it was kind of, the same stuff. I wasn't really doing much with who I wanted to be or what I wanted to do. And uh, being out here, I'm kind of hoping now it's a new start so I can completely like build off what I was doing out there or go completely different and just, you know, see what, see what, how it is. Uh, Cause it is a, it is very different. Um, Not just like, you know, how the guys wrestle out here and what gets the crowd going. But, like, the people in the back, it's mm. it's insanely different and in the best way possible. That's good. And, you know, talking about moving to the Midwest, there's a couple promotions that damn burps like crazy right now. All right. I should maybe stop drinking Dr. Pepper when I'm trying to record one of these. <laughs> But there's a couple promotions. One I'm a little more familiar with because I, well, I think next week I'll actually be releasing the episode with, I got introduced to Mid-States Wrestling by Big Joe Helms. Had yep. him on, like I said, releasing his episode as of recording this next week. And kind of Curious what you got going on there because I I'm getting introduced to a lot of new places, new promotions. That I mean, yeah, I'm in Omaha. I don't get to travel too far away. I mean, about Kansas City, Des Moines is about as far as I really get anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no. Um... Mid States is it's cool because it was a, uh, it was one of those connections through uh, Tony Ray's my father in law because uh, he's from mm. out out this way, and he wrestled for a lot of these promotions and uh, Mid States is run by uh, a man named Jason Jones, and uh, he amazing amazing dude loved working with him loved working for him, um it's cool he partnered uh, he kind of put me in see what I could do. I, uh, my first thing there was a battle royal. Like I was in there for like two minutes. 
Mm-hmm. Nothing, nothing to write home about. But, you know, after that, he's given me uh, matches against some of their students, uh, their younger guys. And then uh, he's partnering me up with, uh, um, I want to say his name right, Niles uh, Rabid. Uh, he's a, he's a, a British dude who's a manager. And he's from, he's out right now in Texas, but he's traveling around. And uh, the connection's been amazing. Like just to that one night with, uh, it was me, him. And a wrestler there named uh, Dread Roberts um, at Mid States, cool dude, and it like our instant chemistry. We just all kind of mesh together well. We all look different. Like you just look at us and like uh, these guys can't work as a team, mm-hmm. but we all have that same uh, that same drive. We all want the same thing. We're feeling the same thing, and we're gonna complete what we want to complete. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Oh, have have that same mentality. You know. It, it it's cool when you get a group together that you know might not necessarily look like they would mesh like that, but it kind of proves that whole "don't judge a book by its cover" sort of thing. Because yeah. hell, you guys working as well the way you guys have just proving that point yeah and it, it kind of fits with like how my life has gone because like throughout high school my group of friends we all couldn't have looked more different from each other like so from the way we dress the way we you know the, the music we listened to like everything was just completely different but what brought us together was like uh we just didn't fit in with everyone else either like we we're just kind of our own little misfit group uh it was it was kind of something that just kind of stuck with me. So as I went on yeah. with wrestling, I kind of like, you know, attracted all the misfit wrestlers and kind of, you know, got direct, you know, got pulled in with them and different promotions that were labeled the misfit, you know, mm-hmm. like uh, one of the companies uh, in Orange County, is Orange Orange County Championship Wrestling. Mm, yep, yeah. heard of it. C- OCCW. Uh, probably not a lot of great things, but when i when i first started there they were you know any other like any other show 20 30 people and me and rudy you know he's the one that kind of brought me to them because i took a couple of years off i got a divorce and uh got really big hit like 350 uh so wasn't feeling it throughout that i dropped down 100 pounds and he you know he was like hey dude there's a there's a company out here in orange county which we you know i was living in and he was like, dude, let's let's go check it out. You know, what's the harm? So I went to go check it out and ran into Tony Rays. And it was funny because, you know, when I first started wrestling in 2000, um, like my first year, complete year in, in 2012, Tony Rays was coming from Missouri to California back and forth. And we actually wrestled um, a six-man match with them. And it was like, it was like the weirdest, funny story. Like, you know, we were doing our spots, all of us. Everyone on my team was a year in. We're all talking, all you know, going over the match. We're gonna do this. You do this and this and spot, 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 spot. And he's sitting there waiting. Has this little smirk on his face. Waits until the end. Just like I'm not gonna remember any of that. So we'll call it out in the ring, and I'll talk to you guys, kid. I'll see you out there, kid. And just walk. Gets up and walks away. And I'm like. <laughs> You know, and this is my first year in. I've never had that experience. You know, everyone always wants to go through every nook and cranny of the match from start to finish. And I was just blown away. And I was like, all right, cool. And we go into it. And it was like, yeah, it was a lesson. It was a nice little life lesson, you know, get you to listen and pay attention in the ring. And then at the same time, still cater to the crowd, you know, because you, you kind of see it too when you watch matches. You'll see guys like, intently looking at their guy or, you know, looking like mm-hmm. playing the uh, the spots in their head and it just doesn't look as natural. Now, when you go out there and you still kind of lost, but you're beating the shit out of each other, it kind of works because, you know, that looks more natural. And mo- in the most, for the most part, when you see a fight, like you when you watch MMA, it's not, it's not pretty. These guys are, you know, trying, it, it looks ugly when they're beating the crap out of each other. Mm-hmm. And that's what I kind of like when I, when I wrestles, I like that, uh, like, I like the flow of things, but at the same time, I don't, like, when I rewatch it, I'm like, ah, oh, that just looks too 
that looks too pretty. That looks too polished. It's just, you know, so being out here, it's kind of nice because almost all the matches I had out here have been, all right, this is the finish. See you out there, kid. We'll, we'll, we'll just talk out there. And I'm like, hell yeah, let's go. You know, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it's. Oh, I was just going to say when it comes to, you know, you're talking about watching back matches and stuff. It, it's kind of why, other than the editing process of the podcast, I've yet to actually watch anything back because I would just pick myself apart. Yeah, you you're usually your worst critic, and that's how I am. Dude. Like I, if it's not for the random like pops that you hear from the crowd, or even like um, I have like a. How, how do I explain this? Like, I, I take pride in stuff I create. Like, if I can create it and it's something I'm proud of, like, I love it. And if I come up with a spot and we actually execute it and it comes out the way I want it, then I'm happy. Sometimes it doesn't and it still gets the same pop, but I'm like, ah, you know, could have tuned yeah. this up a little bit. This could have been a little bit cleaner. You know, it's just, yeah. it's a, yeah, it's, it's a, I feel like it's a artist thing and it, and it sounds douchey calling myself an artist, but like, it's kind <laughs> of, you know, <laughs> you kind I, of I see can, it. I can, I can relate. I can definitely relate to that because it's just, if it weren't for the positive feedback that I've got, it, it all means the world to me, but yeah, if it were just me kind of just doing everything oh god i would be just i am my own worst critic i'll fully admit it i oh god i just i pick myself apart even even in editing i'm like okay i gotta try to uh, just okay i'm just putting this together <laughs> try not to watch too closely but then i get a long enough clip and i'm like oh god did i sound like that so yeah it's, it, no yeah it's rough like that's how i feel when i film promos like I, i'll legit do like 30 takes on a 10 10 second to a 30 second promo just because i don't like the way my voice slowed or if the camera wasn't exactly where it's at because one of my one of my main passions is like wanting to direct i love directing i used to do little short films in high school and me and my buddies just, just film like little clips and just dumb spoofs, you know, dumb mm. things here and there. Uh, stuff that would definitely get us canceled, you know, 100%. <laughs> but you got to remember early 2000s. Yeah. You know, no one no one gave a damn, or at least the people who did, you know, weren't in power yet. So, <laughs> yeah. It was, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's funny, though, to kind of like think back on how wrestling, how wrestling was and how it is and just the, uh, like the culture transition it's uh oh, totally it's funny but at the same time being out here in the midwest you know they always say you're about 10 years behind so you know being backstage is like how it was when i first started wrestling in california you know the 10 years behind mm -hmm. i'm 10 years i'm 13 years in so it's like being back at home you know <laughs> i i can get it all right, now I'm just kidding, Mid Midwest folks. I'm just kidding. I love you guys. <laughs> Hospitality, I love it. <laughs> oh yeah. All right, now new breed wrestling. That's one I'm not as familiar with. Now, what do you got going there? Like, I, I love learning about new stuff. I love getting introduced to new wrestling. What do you got going on with new breed wrestling? Well, um, and this is going to look like a pattern here, but I'm part, I'm also part of a faction there too. Um, I, I just, uh, they were one of the, like when I first moved out here, I, the first thing I did was look up wrestling schools, you know, wrestling schools, promotions, whoever, um, obviously mid, mid States was the first one that was thrown to me. Uh, I do read on my own. Um, can you hear my, sorry, my headset died. <laughs> oh yeah. I can hear you just fine. Let's see. Hold on. Oh, there we go. All right. Um. So, I found Mid States on my own, and um, I think it was because uh one of the people was probably Joe, like uh, mm. my father-in-law threw his name out there or something like that, or somehow 
I looked at Joe's page. I saw New Breed as one of them, and I was I don't know Missouri very well when I first moved out here, so I was like, oh, let's see where this. Oh, damn, this is an hour and a half away. Ah, you know, it's better than two, three hours like most places. So where I'm at, from where I'm at, and uh, I was like, all right, you know. So I, I messaged them, and out in Missouri, you have to have a wrestling license. So before I was able to get all that done, I was in a truck accident, um, mm. messed up my back. I was kind of half paralyzed for a couple of weeks, couldn't move really. Um, after two years of uh, physical therapy and getting you know, everything, doctor's checks, whatever, I got the okay to go back to regular work. Now, I took that as because I can work a regular job, mm. I can wrestle, you know, I can work that too. Yeah. So I had, you know, uh, slightly, uh, a slightly animated conversation with my wife about jumping into the ring so soon after everything. She wasn't fond <laughs> of it. I was like, you know, this is what you married. You married a wrestler. It's what I do. <laughs> and um, Mid States and uh, New Breed was the first people I messaged. And they, uh, new breed came back and was like hey you know we have all these shows get your license and we'll see what you got and i went and immediately i uh, got linked up with uh money mike pettis he is a manager there and he was part of a, a group called private practice where the heavyweight champion dr eisen you know why we're called private practice and then uh they had different members interchangeable you know throughout the time you know because wrestling Sometimes you can be there, sometimes you can't. And I got thrown in with these guys, and I felt, you know, a really good connection with the backstage. Like, everyone super welcoming, and it wasn't, like, that fake, like, uh, oh, how you doing, brother? And then, uh, yeah. this, this guy, look at this new guy, whoa. You know, like, yeah. everyone was cool. They wanted to get to know me. They were, they, like, you know, they treat it right, because, you know, you call people brother because you're trusting them with your life in there. These guys are actually attempting to to make that connection to do, you know, because eventually you're going to have to wrestle them. And, you know, if you're set up for a power bomb, you're going to want to trust this guy that he's going to power bomb you and <laughs> not drop you on your head. Cause yeah, that's, that's happened to me a few times and not fun. No, but on, I the imagine. Side, on the opposite side, I've had, you know, guys to save me that I've trusted with my life. Uh, uh, he was a tough enough um, contestant, Eric Watts. Uh, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm big nasty. Familiar. Yeah, uh, I wrestled. I wrestled a Comic Con out in San Diego or uh, Long Beach. Actually, it was my first and only because that you know, kind of that's kind of how it works with those ones. But I would love to do a Comic Con again. It's where I got to meet my idol. You know, the Black Ranger, boom, Walter, Walter Jones, uh, um, Power Ranger stuff. I, uh, Jason David Frank. That, that's that was the guy you know i i always was a black ranger fan um can't tell you why well i can't tell you why hip-hop keto you know mm. that's the best way to watch someone get their ass kicked you, not only is this guy beating you up but he's dancing while he's doing it you know like no oh, yeah yeah i love that but anyway yeah <laughs> got to wrestle there uh one of the moves that eric watts does his finisher is the razor's edge mm. Well, it was just bad timing or something. You know, I was really big at the time, too. He might have underestimated how big I was. But he went up, and I just didn't – wasn't able to follow up. And then he started dropping me, and as I was – I was headed head first. I was done. Everyone that was watching was like, dude, I have to call his wife now and tell her that he fucking died, that he's done. And last second, Eric Watts grabs my face, pulls me in, and turns it into a, a dominator. Like – so smooth it was so oh it didn't even look like he like there was a mistake it looked like that was part of the plan the whole time like it it's just having having that trust in guys and and then very you know very most importantly them being trained if it wasn't for the fact that he was trained the way he was and as long as he was you know he probably would have dropped me on my head you know and we wouldn't yeah. be having this podcast right here <laughs> no, yeah well, you would still be having it. I wouldn't be. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, you bring up Comic-Con. I actually 
you know, I was just looking back at some of my collections back here. I've all, I was always more of a Ninja Turtle guy myself. All right. Grew up on like the original cartoon, the original live action movies and stuff. And actually at a comic con here, this last, oh God, it was like middle to end of July. I actually got to meet the, well, I'm trying to reach back here and grab these. The voice of the original Michelangelo from the cartoon. Nice. All right. And the voice behind Splinter from the first two movies. No way. That's awesome. Yeah. Because yeah, um, I, I grew up, uh, I was born in 90, so I'm a little, a little too young for the cartoons. But the movies were spot on, like right when I was growing up. And I, for me personally, I was a Raphael fan because I was hot headed, you know. Got to stick together. I, yeah. yeah, I was <laughs> always a a Michelangelo guy. So when I I even I even told him the guy that voiced him in the original cartoon, I was like, when I heard you were going to be here, that that sold me on coming. <laughs> that sealed the deal. Nice. All right. Yeah, we got and I told him about Michelangelo was always my favorite and. We got into a solid like five seven minute conversation just off of that, dude. See, that's always nice to see like that. Uh, it's like you know to have that connection, and it's not just a quick sign picture. All right, peace. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I've I've definitely been to my fair share of those. So yeah. we won't we won't go into the negativity. That, <laughs> wow, that I sounded like I just butchered that up negativity aspect of it but hey i gotta i've been able to meet some pretty cool people but before i get into too big of a tangent all right i have two categories that i like to round off the show with one's a bit of a name game where i try to theme it towards the guests as much as possible you know and since you know we have in the in Missouri and California, I'm like, I picked four people, two of them professional wrestlers that are known from Missouri, and two from California. I give you the name, you give me some quick thoughts on the person. All right. First one, one of uh, well, he's a damn legend in the business. A guy that definitely brought up Midwest professional wrestling, the King Harley Race. <laughs> that's that's definitely a name that gets thrown uh, thrown out a lot out here. It's uh, it's it's Midwest royalty right there, man. There's no uh, like every time you bring up the licensing or anything that has to do with promoting, you know, someone brings up Harley Race. You have to bring them up. Uh, my father-in-law. You know, he, he comes highly recommend or like uh, highly praised in our family because my father-in-law trained under under Harley and everything. So I I know, you know, the respect and then be, me being a fan and my dad being a fan, you know, there's there's nothing but respect for that guy. And just watching him rest like and those like old school, old school moves or simple moves as you would put them now. Dude, they get like the biggest pops out here. Like, um, Joe Helms, um, we wrestled at New Breed on Saturday. He hit a spine buster, dude. You would have thought that he hit a five forty off the top of a rafter. You know what I mean? Like the the biggest pop. Like they they pop so hard for that, and it's like the simple simple thing. So you know, any any of you young wrestlers out there watching or whatever, you don't have to you know light yourself on fire or get hit by a car to get a pop. You know, just mm -hmm. Practice the simple things, oh, facial yeah. expressions, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and hell, I'm I love a good spine buster. Like you see those people that is just crisp and powerful, and it looks like they could literally slam them through the mat. Yeah, like it, you could finish it with that spine buster. Like some guys can hit it so effort effortlessly, and it's it's a it's a sight of beauty, right there. Like. Oh. One of my favorites is Arn Anderson Triple H. You know, oh god, yeah, 
Triple the H. Best ones. Like I know everyone everyone calls it the Arn Anderson, but in my opinion, man, like Triple H really made it like he, he took that, dude. And like it's yeah. like i that's all I think about because Triple H made it so brutal too and like pretty. Like he would pick you up and like you would see guys kind of glide in the air and then he catches them and slams them. And it's like, dude. And like a part of a lot of that is people taking it, you know, posting, sell, you know, selling, but you have to be strong enough to, to do the twist and everything. And, oh, but yeah. yeah, sorry. My, my tangent on the spine busters. Love them. <laughs> <laughs> no, Hey, I, I, I love getting to talk about all that. Now, the next guy on this name game, I, I myself, my issue with him is more outside, you know, outside of wrestling. But I can't take away from the stuff he's been able to accomplish in the business. The Viper, Randy Orton. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it's 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 kind of it's kind of hit or miss because I still see I still see stuff as a fan. You know kind of have to to kind of to have that balance like when i put matches together i i do it as a fan so you know when you talk about all the outside stuff and you hear like the the dirt stuff about what he used to do to new wrestlers and stuff like that you're kind of like ah what an ass but uh just he's it's it's art watching him in the ring dude like some of the yeah. stuff that he does like those rkos and like yeah just and like not even that but like he kind of like uh, what's the, like you know like when there's in, there's indie wrestling and then there's non indie wrestling, he he kind of was like one of the guys that would bring some of that element into the mainstream, like some of the backbreakers and the way he would catch people. It was it was really cool to see. It was really like fun to see that. Yeah, as like a main like it's like when you take B rate horror films and then you mm-hmm. bit a big budget. Like that was kind of what he was doing. He was cleaning some of that stuff up and making it super believable and putting in putting in putting them in times where it wasn't just thrown away like he would hit that backbreaker and it was like oh dude this you know he would stop the momentum of the match and it was like the roller coaster ride so that's where like he that's why people call him the goat you know he has that that presence about him like you know it's it's one of the problems i have too is like i'm able to separate the art like the art from the artist or you know what i mean like yeah there's the main controversial wrestler that no one likes to talk about you know what he did or allegedly did to his family versus what he did in that ring was like you know you can't take that away that's why you see people do the cross face and different it's like yeah we're not necessarily honoring the man that was behind the character, but we're honor we're honoring that character because that's who we fell in love with. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so no. with Randy Orton, I feel like it's more of the same. Like if you look at Randy Orton, who we saw on TV, it's amazing. And then plus like the stuff that he was at, he was honestly one of the first uh equality like he, you know, he was all about equality. You were a man or a woman, he'd kick you in the head or give you an RKO. It doesn't matter. You know? Yeah. Yeah. He, they wanted <laughs> no definitely i think my whole thing you know i don't know if it's me being a veteran but when i hurt when i would hear about how he got himself kind of basically kicked out of the marines i was like what the fuck <laughs> And that kind of soured me on him for a while. But then I'm like, you know what? Like I mentioned when introducing him in this category, I can't take away from what he's been able to accomplish in the ring, the stuff that he's given to the business. So that, all the respect to him for that. Yeah. Yeah, he he's done a lot and it's, and like, like I said, you know, he's had he's had his problems or whatever, but yeah. he's been a constant stable. You know, like he True. he's kind of part of so many main storylines as you know, me growing up, a lot of you know, a lot of fans. He's been there. You, you know, you think of a childhood memory or something, or a me- yeah. from 
teenager, or early twenties, yeah. or a wrestling fan, most likely one of those memories is Randy Orton doing something crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah. hey, he's he's one of the few still sticking around the business from back then when he first got started. So hey, he's doing something right. All right, yeah. now the two California guys. This guy a bit of polarizing, but hey, he gets a reaction out of people. The Miz. <laughs> um, it's, it's hard to say, you know, like because, like I said, the fan, the fan side of me is like, there's nothing much to write about, you know. Like he's been there, he's been part of this, you know, it's part of it for a long time. He's had his shocky moments, but it's you know, I'm never as a fan. I'm never like, oh man, I can't wait to see the, what the Miz does this week, or can't yeah. wait to see the line with the Miz. But he's he's been a crucial uh, a player, you know, in the storylines. He he does his part. He's been there long, you know. He's had injuries, but like nothing that's ever sidelined him. You know, he's done great for himself. Yeah. You know? So it's it's kind of hard to it's kind of hard to be like, yeah, he he's amazing because it's like you know, he, would I work him? Oh hell yeah, because it would be honestly mm-hmm. it'd be a pretty straightforward match. You don't have to worry about a whole lot and you know it's going to get the job done. But at the same time, you know, you know, for the most part, unless it's scripted, you're not going to have that amazing, you know, this is awesome moment. Yeah. And, and not, you know, nothing against him, nothing to take away from him. But, you know, during his feud with LA Knight, my son was starting to be a fan of The Miz. And, and I just can't have that. So, you know, <laughs> Miz, this is BS and you need to stop it. All right. Leave my son alone. Okay. We're all we're an LA Knight family. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now to round off this category, the same uh brain fart here. The same Comic Con that I gotta meet those two uh people from the Ninja Turtle genre. I also gotta meet this guy, Rikishi. Oh, nice! All right, I've I've never actually got to have like any kind of interaction with him. I've known, I know he did uh, uh the school of heart. No, not the school. Was it uh Knox Pro? Knox Pro, yeah. yeah. Um, I became pretty good friends with one of their uh students, uh, Shiloh Graves. Reeves. Oh yeah, I know. Love that. I love that guy. Uh, I know he. Everyone has their opinion about him. You know whatever opinion that you have is most like if it's negative it's most likely wrong he's like the most loveliest guy on this planet he he's amazing um but i obviously was a fan growing up too cool rikishi Oof. you know i was fat growing up so i was always i was always having to be the rikishi character so i had to do all the dances and the stink faces and whatnot but you know that's that's where the love grows, you know, and you kind of watch, you know, he, he's another guy that you kind of have to admire because how many people are going to be like, all right, you're going to wear this thong, something that you're probably insecure about your big, butt. Mm-hmm. we're going to, we're going to put a spotlight on that. And that's going to be the butt of the joke. You're going to be the butt of the joke, but here's a check. And you know, yeah. some people, some people are like, that's a no brainer. Duh. You're getting a check from WWE. But like I say, a lot of people, when they come into this mm-hmm. business, they want to take it serious. You know, it's it's a serious yeah. thing for the, their character. And a lot of them won't won't take that, you know, like they yeah. feel like being insulted. But it's kind of like you have to, in wrestling, you just have to kind of, if you want to wrestle, you kind of have to do what you got to do. And like True. I've had a, I've had a moment where um, I used to wrestle for uh, Brian Kendrick, um, his oh, yeah. wrestling for wrestling. Um, and I went there with Mikey O'Shea because uh, he was part of a battle royal. And um, Mikey was like, hey, if you want, I can ask and see if you can get in the battle royal. And I was like, yeah, hell yeah, dude. You know, brought my gear. I'm always down. Um, he he asked and Brian Kendrick was like, oh, sure, yeah. And he goes, uh, so who do you want to be? Shitty Superman or El Poto Loco? <laughs> and like I'm like, uh, I guess Shitty Superman because Superman is – you know, the perfect specimen and I'm quite, I'm not. So I think that would work. (laughs) 
but another guy, I guess, fit the mold because he already had the glasses. So they gave him shitty Superman. They made me El Pollo Loco. So I was like, okay, so, you know, what do you want? What do you need from this character? And he goes, well, what do you want to do? What do you, you know? And I was like, well, since I'm on the spot, El Pollo Loco means the crazy chicken. So do you want me to be a crazy chicken? And he goes, do you want to be a crazy chicken? And I was like, well, I'm, getting, I'm getting nowhere with this, but, you know, sure. Yeah. All right. So I do it and, you know, we're, we're waiting and his uh, second in command comes out and he's passing the, uh, the costumes or the, the gear for these special characters. And um, he passed me these green sparkly trunks, a red cape and a white mask that has like a little chicken thing and the kind of a beak. And I was like, damn, how do I tell Brian Kendrick that I'll, I don't want to do this because I've never wore trunks before. I don't, I'm super self-conscious, but like I said, I'm a big dude. Don't think I would look good in trunks. Uh, but um, two wrestlers, because they kind of heard my dilemma with it, um, Tyler Bateman. And, oh, yeah. 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 Oh, and uh, Ruby Rays. They were oh, there. He, I, I've actually, I haven't had Bateman on yet, but I've had Ruby Rays on. Yeah, and uh, they were, they they gave me a a nice little pep talk. You know, it was kind of like you know, you can't be a bitch about it. You know, you either man up and do it or you don't. And I was like, you know, I needed to hear that outside of my head. And I was like, yeah. you know what, I, I, you know, they they didn't say it in that manner. They were more like, you know, you gotta gotta kind of make the best out of what's given to you. Just because it's not what you thought it was or what you wanted to be, doesn't mean it can't be. You can make it, you know, and I was a pretty decent character for them for, you know, as like it started off as just being in the rumble and that's it to being part of storylines. Uh, I got to work a storyline with um, their character, Ricotta Flair, who is played by the great, great voice actor, John Allen, who is on Rick and Morty currently is Mr. Mm. Ruby Butthole. So that, you know, wrestling just takes you places meets you meet new people and it was it's kind of cool to kind of see all the the people that interact with doing these different things oh yeah totally and back to rikishi i have a bunch of signed wrestling figures one the one that i brought to him that day was actually his uh when he was head shrinker fatu oh no shit okay and i got to tell him the story of him as Head Shrinker fought too, being in my first ever WWE show I ever went to when I was like in the third grade. Damn, all right. So that that was a pretty cool experience for me. I I still remember being like we were like maybe five. We were between five and ten rows from the ring on the main floor, like few seats away from the entrance and I got to see one of my personal favorites Big Boss Man All right. go go up against Yokozuna and I you, you can imagine me tiny third grader standing there at the entrance way <laughs> and here comes walking by me Yokozuna <laughs> and I'm just like oh my god that's a whole lot of man. <laughs> yeah. oh. Oh. All right. Now I got some random questions. Some might be wrestling related. Some might not be. Some right. might have absolutely nothing to do with anything we've talked about so far. That's I why like they're random. So I give you the question. You give me first answer that pops in your head. All right. All right. First one, one of them that I like to keep in here because I love the stories. Craziest in match moment for you? Ah, man. Um, I see. This is the now. This is the slight problem with for me wrestling. My memory shot. I <laughs> it happened. So many, yeah, dude. Like, uh, one of the and it's not so much an in match thing. It's more like a. I was excited to wrestle someone named Sean Black. Um, he's heading out Compton Mania, Amped Up Wrestling, mm. does all that. I was super psyched to wrestle him, and everyone was telling me, dude, you wrestled him like twice before. 
I was like, no, I would not like, you know, it's one of my Ooh. good friends. Like I would remember wrestling. And I was like, no, no, you guys, you guys must have me mistaken. And then they proceed to show me pictures from uh, me wrestling them at Lucha Pro in oh. East LA. And I'm like, what the, f-? I was like, dude, what, how? And like, I'm watching and and I was like, oh man, but all right here that, but that made uh, one, this, this one memory snap. So at Lucha Pro, I was wrestling Rudy Rogers and, um, he was doing a suicide dive and like his foot got stuck second rope. And that ring isn't high up. It's pretty low to the ground. So he hit the rope and like his body went this way. And then. straight. Oh. And so I was kind of like, I was a distance away. Cause I know how far he flew. And I seen that and I like kind of dove caught him. But like in my head, I instantly thought like, oh, I'm an idiot because why, if I'm, I've been spending all this time trying to beat his ass. Why am I saving him? So as I was getting up from picking him up, I was like, if anyone's going to kill you, it's going to be me. And I throw him back in the ring. And like, for me, it was like, that was the scariest and funniest intense moment in the ring. Yeah, I, I can. I, <laughs> hey, and you kind of, in a way, saved it there because you, you mentioned the little dilemma, like, oh God, I'm trying to beat this guy's ass. Why am I? But then that little comment right there, kind of like, Oh yeah, that kind of lets it into the crowd. Like, oh yeah, he saved him. But then he's like, "Hey, if anybody's gonna kill you, it's gonna be me." And then, boom! That people don't even remember, you know, the whole like, "Oh, well," the little confusion there. Boom! It sets them right back on track. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm big on the the comedy thing, and that that goes back to Joey Ryan. You know, like he was a super comedic uh, character and it's kind of yeah, like, you know, how I am already. So it was like, Oh, you know, I can kind of use that. And then he's not really wrestling anymore. So I can kind of use it even more, you know, like watch out. My next character is going to be the sleazy Lord on two, the Lord of <laughs> sleaze. <laughs> All right. Now my wife and I actually have both of these, but I, I know people, tend to lean one way or the other here are you a dog or a cat person so we we have both um i never really had pets growing up my first dog was a dog i got with my current wife uh, a few years back um she passed away so i kind of was like a little salty about having any other animal but my wife was really persistent and we have uh, our new dog uh, ophelia uh, she's kind of like a mix, but she lo- looks like a miniature golden retriever. Very beautiful. And then we have this pet cemetery cat that, like, when we moved out to, we moved out here to Missouri, <laughs> and uh, we got we moved into the house we're in now. And this cat just came out of nowhere, dude. And it had like, he like a piece of its head missing. Like it looked, you know, it looked like it was fresh out of a, a cemetery, dude. Like I, I was the first thing I popped no, in my head was pet yeah. yeah, and I was like, nah. I was like. You're not you're not keeping this the cat in here. Like you're not gonna bring the cat inside, right? Like if you want, because my wife was showing affection to it, it was coming to the door every day. She would pet it. I'm like, uh, you know, it's missing part of its skull. Why are you why are you touching it? But she she loves animals and so I was like, All right, well I'll, I'll get a I'll get a bowl. We'll keep it outside. You can put food and buy cat food or whatever for it. It's a wild cat. I don't know why it wants cat food if I can eat some meat, you know. So we do that, and then one day I come home a little early from work, and then what do I see inside my house? That the cat. cat, and it wasn't the first time I uh, we had that conversation. It was it's going ongoing for a while, so now it's our cat. You know, we gave it a oh. name, and it's it kicks it with our dog. They, you know, they lay together. They have like little fun chasing each other around, but it's like, it yeah yeah. So I'm I'm a little bit of both. Yeah, I'm I'm a little bit of both. I've always leaned more towards dog person, but when I first met my now wife, she had two cats. Then we end up getting some dogs. I actually, as of recording this, I had two dogs, but I was literally in the middle of recording with somebody when my wife comes downstairs and she's like, um, I think something's wrong. 
And yeah, we ended up long story short, he had to put her, her down and yeah, that was something I'm still kind of uh, about, but, uh, you know, we still got our, we got a English bulldog right now. And okay. the, the, the story you mentioned with the, the cat, my wife, one time she was telling me about wanting to get another one. I'm like, Arr. she always tells me I can't say no to her, but I'm like, have you seen what happens when I try? They, that I think that's a universal. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, one time I come home i worked evenings at the time and we have one of our spare bedrooms has a window that overlooks the front yard in the driveway i'm pulling in and i see a cat in the window and i'm like okay maybe she put the cats in that room but then i get up the lights on and i'm like that cat looks fluffier than the two <laughs> and i go to go upstairs i don't even get a foot on the step light flips on and my wife's like babe <laughs> and i just go you got another cat didn't you yeah pretty much and now that one has chosen me as its person like if i'm in bed and it decides to hop in there it will start laying on top of me and using my beard as a pillow <laughs> oh damn yeah our, our cat's kind of the same. Like, uh, it it doesn't have a, a set spot to sleep. It likes sleeping everywhere. It'll sleep, sometimes it'll sleep on our on the the top of our couch, right next to the window, and you know, just be sleeping, looking out the window. Um, it'll sleep on our dog's bed that we have set up in the kitchen, it'll, and then mo for the most part, she or he likes to sleep in the bed with us. And someday, sometimes he'll sleep by my wife's feet. He'll sleep next to my sons. Like he, he doesn't care. Like as long as there's someone there to sleep, he'll sleep right next to you. Like I, I even caught him on top of um. So we have our our dog in a crate at night when he sleeps or when she sleeps. Um, I've seen I've seen the cat on top of the crate, like sleeping on top of the crate, and it blew my mind. I was like, damn. I was like, this is this is like uh, was it homeward um homeward bound or whatever homeward bound? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was like that. I was like, oh, it's cool. It's a nice little connection. Maybe that uh, all that uh, dogs and cats hate each other. Just fake news right there, man. Although I my my bulldog, we just had a little incident where <laughs> that one cat that likes me, I was sitting here petting the bulldog, and the cat tries wandering over, and I think maybe got a little too close, and all of a sudden... I just see my bulldog going, Hurr! and I'm like, I, I had to kind of shove him back a little bit. I'm like, okay, no. <laughs> so, I mean, there there are some. Like, it, some get along well, some don't. It's just one of those things. Yeah. All right. Now, with the name of a show like Drinking at Moe's, I would feel weird if I didn't have this question in here. Favorite drink? Whether it be alcoholic or non, or name one of each if you want. All right. Um, so non-alcoholic, I'm a big Coke guy. I love Coca-Cola. Mm. That's, you know, even though one of my favorite wrestlers as a high schooler and uh, in my in my 20s, even now I love watching him, CM Punk. He's nah. a Pepsi guy. Love you, Phil. But I'm a Coke guy. Don't know what it is. It's that classic. As Dan Housen likes to call him Pepsi Phil. Pepsi Phil, yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big guy, you know, for Coke. Every time I go to a restaurant, it's like, is Pepsi okay? No, it's not. Go get me some Coke. <laughs> <laughs> um, drinking wise, you know, um, I, I'm a, I like taste and, uh, this is going to th throw you off, but when I do drink beers, I'll drink a Corona, you know, it's don't know why it's the only thing that kind of just doesn't taste that bad, you know, mm. um, mixed drinks. Again, this is gonna make me sound off, but uh, I think uh, I think it's called like Cosmo Cosmopolitan or like uh, okay. one of, or like a gin and tonic, or I think it's a Cosmo because I went after my divorce. One of my friends, we went drinking a lot. She was going through a breakup too, 
and uh i wasn't big on drinking i was just there for the ride and she would order all these yeah. drinks and she ordered that and i was like yo i was like what's this and she's like it's a cosmopolitan i was like oh my god i feel so uh and again this is probably gonna get me canceled but like at the time you know you you would label it you know, yeah, you know a girly drink yeah know. the girly drink or you know but uh, girls have they might they're onto something man because their drinks are not only tasteful but yeah, it's even <laughs> better than a beer does i'll tell you that yeah. you enough yeah. menu <laughs> i've i've always been more of a beer guy but i do like some mixed drinks I, hell well i don't really know if it is considered a mixed drink but i'm i love a good margarita as much as anybody oh yeah but i, I feel like that's that would be considered a mixed drink it's a mexican mixed drink <laughs> yep and uh speaking of coke jack and coke with grenadine basically oh. tastes like a jack and cherry coke oh okay i never never had that with the grenadine but i've had jack and coke a lot and jack now and coke. Next time, try it with grenadine. It literally tastes like a Jack and Cherry Coke. Definitely, I'm gonna give that a try because I, I love Cherry Coke. That, for me, that's like a you know you smell something or you taste something it reminds you of childhood. You know, like yeah, from Ratatouille. Like it's a weird one, but Cherry Coke for me, it takes me to when me and my dad used to go to Del Taco, like, mm. and you know he would order, he would order you know his his meal and then he would have Cherry Coke and then I would get to sips from him when my mom wasn't looking you know yeah. and like just every time i drink it it just takes me to that moment and i'm like all right you know so now you know oh yeah no i totally get it all right now as of recording this we are just still what a couple days away from thanksgiving yep now everybody has their favorite thanksgiving food but what would you say least favorite for you my least favorite, um, probably I don't really touch yams or like cranberry sauce or anything like that. You okay. know? Yeah. yeah, I'm like a child when it comes to Thanksgiving dinner. You know, I like the the basic. I get turkey stuffing, mashed potatoes, gravy, and corn. Like I'll legit make my own little, you know, the the KFC mash bowls. Yeah, the, pretty those, much. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna do that with Thanksgiving plates. It's gonna be a Thanksgiving mash bowl. Everything's going to be all mixed together because the mashed potatoes, gravy, and corn just adds that extra something yeah, to everything, something. you know? I know, but yeah, what, what we, oh yeah, we already said the least favorite. Mine, people give me shit about this, but I, oh God, last time I even tried one, I about cute deviled eggs okay yeah you know what i can see it because like it, it's kind of a texture thing too like that, that i think is what it is for me i think it's a yeah. texture thing because like one time i tried it and like i said i about puked and now every time my family has them at something they give me shit like hey you want to train them like and get that thing away from me I, I know that that pain because well I'm I'm the same way with Mexican food I don't like Mexican food beans rice anything like that I just can't do um everyone fucks with me with that like my parents you know oh we're gonna we're gonna get your boys we're gonna take your boys and go get some beans and rice I'm like nah they're they're gonna you're not gonna like it. they're just as picky as me like they're but like yeah I I know how that feels where people are like oh you know but the the deviled eggs um uh, yeah like when I look at them I'm like I'm not appetized. But I've had them before, and they're really good. Like I, I thought that they really taste good. It's just surprising because it's like a texture that I don't usually like. Like if I eat something like that, I'm instantly like I feel like that gagging motion already. And with deviled eggs, it looks like it should be like that. But I, at least when it comes to me, when right when I taste it, I'm like, damn, that's good. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I've ever gotten past the. Ugh. Yeah, I I've never been able to get past it since that one time. So I I don't know. I I actually joked with somebody once just recently. They're like, "Oh, well, more for me," and I'm like, "Well, you can have them." Yeah, that's that's all you like that. My my dad, he always like every time they they eat Mexican food or they go somewhere, 
he's like, oh, you don't know what you're missing now. I'm like, I, I do. And I'm, I'm fine with it. I'm not, uh, I'm not okay with that. Like, uh, tamales too. Like I, I despise tamales. Like I, I tried it one time when I was younger and I just remember eating like that first bite. Like I, I just, instantly, my body was like, nope. And like, I was trying to like, I was trying to do it for them because I felt bad because it was one of my aunts that made it and she's mm. like a lovely person. Like she supports me now as a wrestler. Like, uh, she was at that show with, uh, well, half my family was at that show. Like if you rewatch, if you watch that, our match, whenever they post it, you're going to hear half the crowd cheering for us and half the crowd not. Mm. And half that crowd is all of our cousins that haven't seen us in years. Cause my, my tag team partner in that match was my brother. Ah, uh, Yeah. So we had, we had all the cousins that haven't seen us in a few years and they all came out and they were supporting us. And, uh, it was it was really great to to see and feel. You know, I was just hoping that they didn't want to go out and have Mexican food afterwards. I was like, no, I'm here strictly for burgers, baby. I'm like, take me to a hole in the wall, the best places. <laughs> exactly. Sometimes those, you know, hole in the wall places that you wouldn't really think much of at first, sometimes they got the best stuff. The way it works is if you drive past it and it scares you, they're gonna have good burgers. If, yep. if you if you feel like you have to lock your doors as you're driving by, you're gonna have to stop and get food there because it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna change your mind, and you're gonna love it. Oh yeah! All right, now last but not least, best advice for anybody wanting to get into wrestling. The best advice is uh, do not be sensitive. Like you have to, you have to have that ability to take criticism because you're not going to get better it, whether it's from other people or yourself you have to have to have that that ability to take criticism because some people are going to be good with it and they're going to be like oh hey you know you, you did this maybe next time try to do this and then some people are going to be like yo don't ever do that again you're going to hurt somebody or yourself unless you try you know you train or you do this or you do that and you know a lot of people take both of those stuff like as insults like you can come up to somebody the nicest way possible and they're still going to be like oh so you think i'm garbage you don't you know and it's it's a bad mindset to have in wrestling you yeah. have to want to be good at, you have you have to constantly want to be learning and being better and involving because if you don't you're going to get to a point where no one's going to want to work with you because one either you are just unpleasant and you don't want to listen to criticism or ideas or two you're not training as as much or you're not training and you're hurting people and you're starting to botch more and shit starting to happen more. And it's not something it, that's not who you want to be in the wrestling business. You don't want to be labeled as, Oh, that's the, that's fucking botch mania over there. Mr. Botch mania. You know, you don't want that. Yeah, de definitely don't want that. And I guess the way I would think of that is, you know, having that, thick skin because not everybody's going to come across as nice about it but the way to look at it that I always try to think of it is you can't expect to improve on anything if you don't know what's something you need to improve on so, like if you're just doing everything perfect then oh, you're just going to keep going but yeah, like not you know, all of us can be Tom Brady you know? Oh, yeah. And <laughs> hell, you, you could be doing something wrong, nobody's telling you, so then you just keep going about it thinking, hey, everything's fine. That That's a kind of a big problem, too, and it's, and it's like the wrestling business everywhere is, it's, and then part of, part of this problem is people not having the thick skin because everyone just wants to be like, oh, great job, bro. Congratulations. Oh, that was a good match. Good shit out there. Good, you know? Even if you like fucked up a bunch of spots or weren't that great, you're still gonna receive that when you get back there, and it's uh it's kind of hard like because you want like at least for me you know I would like to be told yo dude that wasn't that great out there like you need to clean it up more you need to you know uh you're you're hitting the ropes stronger like when you're when you're when you're punching the guy you're not making enough contact or you're you're too stiff out there like you know. Like it, it's good to hear those things because then you can make that mental list. All right. Next time I go to training, I need to work on this, this, and that. 
Yeah. Definitely, you know, any young wrestlers out there, or even guys who have been doing it for years, take, and, take notes on yourself. Write down what you want to learn. Take that training. Ask your trainers, hey, I want to learn this. I want to do this. There's a spot I saw that I kind of want to emulate. You know, let them know what you want, and they're going to let you know if they if you're ready to learn it. Because wow. when I first started training, I remember – these two dudes came in. Um, I don't know if they were brothers or friends, but they were. They went to two practices, and on the third practice, and I shit you not, they looked. Um, our other trainer was a. Uh, he went by Johnny Goodtime at the time, but now he's I, Kevin. I Durkin. know who you're talking about. Yep, they looked him dead in the eye and was like, "So when do we learn tombstones and uh, swanton bombs?" I was like, I "Like, I, I if I had pearls, I would have clutched them." And I would have been like, because I was like, dude, I'm like, who asked that? Like, I was only in the business for like three months, you know, training wise. And I knew like, you don't, you don't just straight up, hey, when do we do this? Or when do we learn this? And they're like, you don't. They're like, you learn how to wrestle and then that's going to come eventually. And I didn't see them again. (laughs) Mind you, at, at this school, you had to pay 250 just to join. And then it's 25 a class or 200 for the month and you get to go to all classes. And so I don't know if these, I know these guys both paid their 250 to get in because they were there for, you know, a week or so, but you know, you guys just dropped 250 on, Oof. you know, pretty much uh, an experiment. <laughs> like, you know, Yeah. Just, and you guys even get that full, you know, cause I don't even think they really did bumps. They really learned the bumps yet. And they were like, Oh, we ran the rope, so we're gonna do tombstones and stuff. Oh, man, <laughs> yeah, some people a little too eager, I guess. Yeah, but anyways, that is about all we have. But before we go, where can people find you social media wise and all that? So if they don't already have their eyes on you, they can go ahead and get them there. Well, on Facebook, I have my uh, my work page, which is Lord A Two, L O R D. A T E U, like the Lord ate you. Um, um, um. And then you got my uh, regular Facebook page, Angel A2. On Twitter, I am Lord A2010. And then on Instagram, I'm Godless Angel 010. Um, yeah, Godless and A2 mean the same thing, just in a different language. So there you go. <laughs> Anywhere right. you go. Know, I'm going to be in Missouri. Hopefully, I'll be out in California every once in a while for 3PWA. And if any other companies out there want, you know, to relive the old glory days with uh, me and them, you know, just, you know where to hit me up. (laughs) All right. We'll get all that in the description. That is about all we have. Thank you for taking the time to talk to me tonight. Best of luck out there. New breed, mid-states, 3PWA, and wherever the heck you end up finding than yourself out there in this crazy business. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you for having you. me. It was really fun. That that means a lot. I, I try to keep it lighthearted and fun. I enjoyed it, man. Thank you so much.